19th meeting of the Technical Advisory Council of the Confidential Computing Consortium. We get together every couple of weeks to have discussions about confidential computing and how we can make the world a little safer place with that. Uh, we believe that coming together as a group, we can do more to advance this technology than we can as individuals or as individual companies. Since we do have a variety of companies, we also have to abide by the antitrust policy of the confidential of the uh, Linux Foundation. And you can read more about that on linuxfoundation.org slash antitrust dash policy. We have a pretty fun agenda today. Instead of one tech talk, we have a double feature. So uh, we have um, <clears throat> we have the first talk coming from Ji uh, Chang Lin from the Center for Distributed Confidential Computing in Ohio State. Looking forward to that. And then we have another tech talk from Patrick Eugster on uh, formal programming techniques. Uh, after that, we have Ab joining us from the repositioning working group, uh, looking for some help on uh, supply chain use case. And then if we still have time after all of that, we'll return to the discussion that we started last session uh, about attestation terminology. Is there anything else people were expecting to hear today? Okay. Let's take a quick look at the participants. We don't have anything that we need to vote on today. We like to avoid making these meetings about voting on things. But taking a quick look, it seems like we've got really good attendance from the, the voting members. Uh, but everybody gets a voice in our community. Uh, everybody's invited to contribute constructively. So if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself in the community and you'd like to, uh, feel free to pop off of mute and let us know how you like to be addressed and what your interest in confidential computing is. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline, um, and I am joining from Microsoft. I am uh, I work in the CoreOS platform team on confidential computing technologies. Been working on that since the start. So, so that's where my interest comes from. It's just, it's been a great uh, set of projects we've been working on. And this is the first time I'm joining. Well, welcome to the community, Caroline. Thank you, Dan. Welcome, and I didn't Caroline. quite catch you said, uh, uh, what platform team? The CoreOS platform team. So Azure oh, Engine platform. Right. Core OS. Yeah, so the okay. Azure host OS basically is our team. Great. It changes well, names yeah. <laughs> quite often, but that's the current one. Sounds good. Thank you. See a number of new names out there. Don't have to be shy to uh, to introduce yourself. So All right. Well, I'm it, here. It, I'm here for the first time, but I'm going to give a talk later, so I I would probably do it then if that's okay. Sure. Glad to have you here, Patrick. Um, All right. Well, if at any point anybody would like to introduce introduce themselves or they feel more comfortable doing that over the uh, over the chat, feel free to do that. Uh, in addition to these meeting series, we have a mail list and uh, Slack and other uh, other avenues to, to contribute. Um, you can find most of that information out on uh, the Confidential Computing website. Uh, last session, we went over a uh, uh, host of questions that Mike Purcell elicited from a, a document that he was working on and has since uh, decided to, to move away from that particular document, but it sparked uh, a lot of questions for things that we may have underdefined. And so some of those questions 
uh, were forked out to uh, existing working groups like the attestation working group and some of them we've taken onto the mail list. And so again, time permitting, we'll, we'll come back to that topic at the end of today's meeting. Uh, we also had a tech talk from one of our newer members who's working on Web3 technologies and how to implement confidential computing in those. Uh, and then we had an update on our internship program or our mentoring program. And so just the, the quick reminder on that again, this is particularly for our projects. Uh, I know it's difficult for our maintainers to find even more time in their day, uh, but the win-win here is, is getting more features, more bugs squashed by, by introducing another person into your part of the community uh, and helping them learn about the technology. And again, information about that uh, primarily is in our governance repo, which is also where uh, you can find the minutes from, from the last meeting that was sort of summarized on that slide. But uh, confidential-computing is the org name. All right, Rian, would you like to take us through the announcements? All right. Um... Okay, I'm going to leave the first one, Salt Lake City to Seoul. So do you want to do that one? Yeah, I'll take this quick update. So QCon is happening at the middle of November. And this is a really great opportunity at the end of the year to elevate any of your final sort of releases, use cases, or demos. Uh, just to highlight that we are about a week or two away from hopefully finalizing our booth uh, arrangements there. And we do need a couple more uh, members to show up to specifically these times, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I do want to highlight that that Wednesday section is the cube crawl. So it is one of the most valuable sections if you have something that you want to demonstrate to a big audience of cloud engineers. Um, I do have one second sort of slide on this uh, KubeCon uh, topic, but I think this is really the one that I wanted to highlight this week. Uh, we need these three slots filled. Let me know. Thanks, Sal. And I think uh, we can skip might have been this the one. Week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and that, I think, brings us, unless, um, Rian, was there anything else? I don't think so. If I can't find the unmute button, no, that's all for announcement. Thanks, Dan. Yes. All right. All right. So that brings us up to our first tech talk. Uh, we have Professor uh, Ji Chang Lin from Ohio State and the Center for Distributed Confidential Computing. Uh, we occasionally uh, are graced with speakers from uh, this related part of the, uh, the technology world. Uh, you can see more about them and their charter here. And I will hand things over to Professor Lin. All right. So um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. So my name is uh, Zhu Jiang Lin. Uh, I'm a professor at the Ohio State University. Um, and uh, I'm part of the CDCC Center. So I have been working on TE for maybe the past 10 years. So uh, today, I think it's our great pleasure to Produce uh, present our our our, our recent, most recent work um, on the sticky policy. Um, since um, my student Sushuan, he really did the work, so I will give the floor to him to uh, introduce our work. So Sushuan. You can unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Shu Xuan Zhao. I'm a PhD candidate working at the SEC lab at the Ohio State University uh, with Professor Lin. Uh, so this is, a, this is our work at the CDCC, which is about collaborated and private data processing using state policy. We gave it a name called states. Uh, this is a work, joint work with Purdue with Professor Ning Hui Li. So, uh, yeah, it's a very fun work and let's dive into it. 
So first of all, acknowledgement. So we like to thank NSF, NSF this work. And so basically what we want to achieve is something. So, so this thing has a lot of names called sticky policy or policy attached data or policy carrying data, a lot of names. But, but basically what this technique has been there for a while, it tries to to tackle a problem in conventional like access control, uh, which basically in conventional access control, you try to embed everything in the code. It's like, for example, administrator can or root account can access, but regular user can't. So this is kind of like a simple policy. Uh, but for sticky policies, like you want to attach the policies to the data so that you can have different policies for different kinds of data. And it's more than just like authentication and stuff. You can put basically like whatever you want into the data. As long as your policy can specify that and you, you have a way to enforce it. But there are many problems about existing solutions. It's that, it's that they doesn't seem to support anything beyond access control. So for example, uh, there's no data in use protection. And that means once the data is like be decrypted and being allowed to access, you have no, you no longer have a way to control how the program uses the data. And also about data lifecycle protection is that uh, when you try, so the data will eventually grow an output out of it. Otherwise, why you want to process the data. So eventually you got to have some output. Uh, but the output is like, what policy should you attach? So these are called derived data, the data derivation. So what policy should you attach and what kind of data can be can be allowed to output? So these are all just like unsolved in the existing sticky policies solutions. And also about dynamic collaboration. So it's like when we got multiple parties, it's not just you, not just your program. It's about a lot of people, different people who are like distrusted, mutually distrusted. So how are you going to solve this? Uh, so for for these three questions, like people try to give their give their solutions. Like for data in use protection, there are like different kinds of encryption based access control. Uh, but they all have to eventually trust the application. And still, so after the decryption part, after the access control part, you no longer have like you you can no longer limit how the program access the data. Like for data lifecycle protection, like like we said, how are you going to protect the output, right? What's allowed in the output? Uh, so what policy should be attached to the output? So so let's take a motivating example. So we we talk a talk a lot about concepts, but let let's see a like a concrete example. Uh, one of the most common thing the hospitals are trying to do right now is that they try to use utilize artificial intelligence like machine learning to train a model that can classify like like diagnose diagnose some diseases for example cancer so what they're going to do is that they're going to have a lot of like like medical records that are so private and confidential and privacy related and also regulations forbid you to like output the data to like to show the data to anyone but but they have to use the data to train a model and so what's going to happen is, is that, uh, may, so you want to protect all the, all these like medical records, but besides of that, because it's a, like, like a jointly trained, like a jointly trained process. So the first question you want to ask is how to make sure, like, like how to limit my data set, right? For example, some, some hospital don't, might not want their data set to be like over 30% in the entire like training set. So how do we achieve that? So that's a policy. You can see that's a policy. And then like, like we said, how do you guarantee the confidentiality of the training set, right? So once the data set, data set is used to train, now you got the, now you got the model, but the model is actually jointly owned. So everyone who contributed to the model should be, should, should be an owner, but it's like, how do you limit the fair use? For example, if, just contribute a little bit towards the model, but I use it a lot, then that's not fair. So you, you can see this is actually a policy on the model. So so this is this is what we want to enforce on the derived derived data. So model is a derived data. 
and also how do you safeguard the model like the model you can't just leave it there right so you then if you leave it there then everyone can access not just those who contributed the the training set so when, once you got once you got the model Another thing a lot of like a lot of people might do, like for example, the hospital hospital might want to use a use that some even even more private data to fine tune their model. They don't want to contribute it to to other hospitals. They just want to have a have a fine tuned model. So first of all, is that even allowed? So you can see this is a policy. So do you allow like a not a hospital who who can use the model to fine tune it? And also after fine tuning, the model should be exclusively owned by the by by the specific hospital who fine tuned it. But uh, but it has jointly owned bits. So like the previously set fair use policy, how do you want to enforce that? So the so there are a lot of like these questions on it. Uh, you you can see you you want to have something on the input side. So you want to inf the input policies. Should be guaranteed on each different on each data. The each data has their own like policy. Uh, you want to have policy enforced on the output side, but besides of that, the processing, the type processing, must also be safeguarded. So, so when we look at these three questions, uh, basically what we try to do is that we we want to solve these questions using using TEs using the trusted execution environments. So, so our proposed solution is that we want to have a T enforced trust and as isolation so that everything can be attested. You know what's going to happen. But uh, we, but besides of that, like like the common common like what we commonly know, the cryptographically encrypted transmission, we also want to have a sandbox success. That means the program running inside the TE. How guarded from like doing doing anything it wants because currently you have to trust what this the software inside the TE you have to trust everything inside the TE but we think that's too that's overkill you shouldn't you shouldn't count on that because some software may have may have bugs uh so we want we also want policy enforced for both input and output so that we have we so we can achieve what we said. Need to have a we need to have a have a commonly like packaged like it's something like a protocol but like a data structure for the policy attached data use here. Uh, so what so our design is that we we have a payload that is totally encrypted. So it has your data, it has a policy, it has like your data attributes, and it is totally encrypted. Uh, but we also need something to help to help the program to to get the key. So so you you need to know you need to know some information like, uh, so that you can use it for remote attestation to get to get the key from a remote like server or, or like like the original owner. So, so it's going to be something like this. Uh, so with this, model the workflow of the of the data so the workflow we what we found is that basically follows a, a producer consumer model so the producer generates the data and the consumer is going to use the data uh, but but it's very likely that the consumer is also a producer because after it uses the data it's going to generate new data uh, but we, what we also want to detach is that we want to detach the owner which we call the custodian because it's a like a legal term, uh, it's a technical owner, so we call it custodian, so that it owns the data. It also owns the producer infrastructure. Uh, but what we, what we want to do is that we want to change, we want to grow this model into a full, into a, into a full like workflow. Uh, so this is our workflow, workflow skeleton. So you can see the producer is going to produce the data and the consumer is going to use it to generate new output. Uh, but you may found that here, we also have something called a key delegator, which we'll introduce it later. Uh, so the entire workflow, like it looks like this, it looks like a very large and complicated workflow, but we're going to, we're going to talk each step of it. So for each, for the first step is that the, the data producer is going to be deployed 
And the data custodian, which is, you, you, if you still remember, it's the technical owner for the data, is going to provision the key and the policy to the, da to the data producer. So it's going to pro also provision the key to the key delegator, which we're going to talk about later why it's there. So the data producer is going to gen generate data because it's a producer. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to have all those data attributes ready. So the attributes is tied to the policy. It's like what the policy wants to know wants to know about the data. For example, like like we like we said, how like the medical re record we talk about how many medical records are there in the raw data is going to be a, be an attribute. So the data custodian and key delegator's information is going to be made into a metadata so that the consumer can later use the metadata to find to find the key. Then it's going to be encrypted and packed into the into the policy attached data we talked before. So this this is basically about the producing, like the 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 gener generating the generating the data. The fun part is about using the data because that's where things could get leaked. So let's now see how it's going to be used. The data, how is data going to be used? So in the data consumer. Uh, what's going to happen? So we want to use a sandbox to have the consumer program, the actual consumer program, inside the sandbox. And the so they're going to have a data. So we have a data set infrastructure. Uh, that means for e that means the that before uh, and have the policy checked over the entire data set before it's allowed to access. So that's how we can enforce like the, the percentage, like you can't be over 30% of the entire data, data set. So this infra infrastructure is there to support that. And here, you can't expect the data custodian is always online. So what's gonna happen is that you all want to have a server there. It's like a service, it's like a TE protected service in the cloud that's running like 24 seven. So that they can always, you can always go there to fetch the key. Uh, and because it only holds the key, so it's a very simple, like enclave protected one, and you can use it remote attestation to do that. And the key is only provisioned to the data, to the data consumer uh, when the attestation is passed. Uh, but note that it, it attests the entire like, con like data consumer enclave. Uh, but the problem is that the consumer program, like we said, we want it to be sandbox, and that essentially means it's not trusted. So it's not part part of the attestation, and we'll talk about how we do how we do that, how we're gonna do that. So do you only attest all the rest of the infrastructure here in the data consumer side? So after the attestation, then you get you provision the key to the consumer side. You can decrypt the data, and the if the policy check is passed, you can. So you you go and consult the policy engine. This policy, as far as you can go, go into the you you can provision the data to the consumer program to allow it to access. But the consumer program is eventually going to generate some data. So you have output data. You have like all those attributes and proposed policies. Uh, the pro problem is that we can't allow it to just go directly output this stuff because first of all, it's not like encrypted into a into a policy attached data or the pad. Uh, and another thing is that you can't say if this output or policy com complies with the original data's policy. So what we're going to do is we're going to have it go through the policy engine. So the policy engine is going to check it against the existing policy. And if it if it passed, you can have a you can have a check policy, checked output data, and these stuff. It's going to generate a new key, and it's going to encrypt it. And the new key is going to be like just like the data producer, new key can be be provisioned somewhere to to a certain key delegator. So that gives us an output path, the output policy attached data with all the output and policy checked. So you can see that the most important part here is actually in the consumer side because it it's not trusted and it is where it could leak could get leaked. So we so in our model we have sandbox, we have like policy engine, we have all this IO protection, and we we have like we need to build up the trust using remote attestation. So how does that translate into an into an architecture? This is just a model. So what we're going to do is so we want to have a middleware. Actually, the middleware is going to be 
going to be used to achieve those. And we use runtime, a, a programming language runtime, for example, like a Python runtime or a WebAssembly runtime. That's what, so we use a WebAssembly runtime to do that. So, so by using a runtime, we actually have more benefits than just having a sandbox. So of course we can achieve all those IO protection, but also because there's a runtime already, we can support a very like a very complex like policy engine and a very diverse policy engine. You can have all different kinds of policy engines implemented in the language that the runtime supports or in the language that can, can be compiled into the runtime languages. Uh, so by having that, we define the we define this set of APIs so that uh, the the policy engine can can achieve all those input and output check in in those pipelines, and we also develop a an architecture independent framework. So the framework is actually written in C and C plus plus, so you can just basically compile it and run it anywhere. Uh, so we detach the TE support and the runtime that you can have different kinds of runtime. You can have different kinds of TE, TEs on the bottom. So we we implemented this this architecture, and so so we so our demo prototype is based on SGX and WebAssembly. Uh, but like we said, these two can be swapped to like to other TEs and runtimes as long as you put a like. You, you put an API translation here. So we have APIs for those. You just said that. So we we tested the performance for the for the whole system. Uh, so the first performance we so we out in our evaluation test is now the data access overhead. So that's a very important thing here because uh, the policy check and the key fetching, particularly the key fetching is is relatively heavy. Uh, so, so with or without key fetching, the performance to go through the go through the Ethernet, you need to go through the entire remote attestation procedure. Uh, you can see that most of the overheads were taken by the uh, by the key fetching process and remote attestation process, but still it's about like a hundred milliseconds. So similar to what you would would expect when an attestation happens. Uh, but if the key's already been fetched to local, so for example, if you are reading two data sets from the same party using the same key, then you can see that the perform the access is actually is actually very fast even when the policy evaluation is, is involved. Uh, so uh, so overall, it's basically about the uh, about the key fetching is the main overhead here. Uh, so to test a like a relatively compelling compelling use case, a more like like close close to real world example. Uh, so we have an so like we said we we want to so our motivating example is about like hospitals training training a cancer detection model. So we tr we also train a cancer detection model using the Wisconsin data set, uh, the Wisconsin breast cancer data set using the SVM to to build the model. Uh, so we consider like three hospitals, ABC is going to train the model and the model is trained on hospital A's machine. So it doesn't have to fetch hospital A's like, like their keys. Uh, and each of those have three, da three data sets to contribute. So in a total of nine data sets. And from the timeline, you can see that the, w the first time when you try to load, load the data set, it has to, so it has to to fetch the key, so, uh, so from the timeline, you can see that it costs about like a hundred, a hundred like and fifty like milliseconds for the first one, a hundred milliseconds for the second one. Uh, but after fetching on those, basically all the policy check and the access and the loading is super fast. Uh, so, so then it trains the model and eventually it outputs. So the mo so the model is not not big, so it's just for demonstration purpose. So the model trains very fast, but. Uh, it gives you a an overall like concept of how things happens in real world. Of course, when the model is larger, so this green bar will go just longer. Uh, so the overhead will be even even smaller in in the in term of portion how long it takes the portion it takes. So because we have a because we have a runtime, so. 
Uh, so there must be a discussion discussion about like how, like for example, a machine learning library like the label on the next, uh, which is a an engine to interpret the on the next when doing inferencing. So we run that benchmark with our system to see how the runtime and and like port, library porting can can affect the system performance. Uh, so what we do is that we put the label on X as a native. Generally, what you want to do when the, when you are porting a library into a system like this, so you can see that uh, the so this is the blue bar is like is like the the vanilla one with no with no runtime or like our framework. And the green bar is ours, so it's like ours is how many times slower than the than a regular one. Uh, so if you look at the the total part, which is about the entire after running the entire benchmark, you can see that the slowdown is generally about twenty percent, uh, which is similar to what you would expect when you have a runtime. Uh, for certain of these benchmarks, that we have like five times or six times slower, that is because the the this this particular this particular procedure is just so fast that our overhead can take a little bit larger in in the portion, but it's not like really taking so long. So the geo mean is about twenty percent. So we showed about our our design and architecture and also about evaluations, uh, but like we only discussed the medical use case, but actually this, as you can see, this framework has many other use cases that can be used. Uh, so, so like, for example, we can have a joint data analysis, like a, a bank, like multiple banks may want to do like fraud analysis. Uh, so they can see the traces from one bank to another to see like how that, like to see if certain account is involved in like money laundering. Uh, but that, that bank transaction is very like privacy related and confidential. So. So while they can be used for analysis, the to know about it. Uh, so and we also want to output the lim to the output to be limited to the original bank where the fraud is found. Uh, so what's going to happen is that you you can see these. So we can have policies on it. This is you can limit on the output, and you can also limit on input like how the like the input cannot be linked linked to a certain other party. Uh, so besides that, we can also have like a we we can also support. There are many cases like chemical compound development. Uh, a company may want to query another proprietary database. Uh, so currently, the if you try to query that database, that database owner will know like what you're querying, and they will know what you're trying to do. So. So this gave those companies a like a like a, an unfair advantage, but now with our system, you can make sure the query is never leaked. Uh, but also the the query the query result is also is also like strictly confined to be used for for one company, not the other, not the other one. And also about smart home IoT, like we can, like this is also a very interesting story that uh, that we actually we developed a. A, a more concrete use case on this for our for for the CDCC. Uh, uh, so for smart home, you have a lot of devices, but those devices generate data. Uh, the problem is you might also have a lot of like cloud service providers who's gonna want to access your data. Not only cloud service providers, but also like your your contracted like home security company or home insurance company. They may want to access your data. Uh, but you can now have like lim you can now have limitations on like what kind of specific type of data you can allow. And when your home has got a break in, then they can access your video footage. But before that, you they can't access. So you can have these kind of policies attached onto your onto the data generated out of, out of your home. So. The project is not like so; it's not perfect, and we have limitations. And we also discuss; we also have envisioned some future works for the project. So, like one of the one of the main main part of this: how do we put this? Put to, how do we do this on hardware accelerators? Like we now have Nvidia's like GPU TEs. Can we push our system to there? 
how do we apply the method to GPU, right? So there are new techniques called like the, the PCIe trusted IO, like AMD has that, like Intel's proposing that. So how do we achieve that? Uh, so we can also have like formal verification on the middleware uh, because the middleware, as you can see, the middleware is where all the trust originates. So we have it to enforce all the sandboxing, all the IO control. So uh, the full stack verification is required, but it's like it's not entirely impossible because we already have the, have a like a formally verified runtime, uh, the MesaPy. Uh, so it's not entirely impossible. Uh, but for on the limitation side, actually, there's a trade-off when we talk about runtime sandboxing is that the runtime sandboxing. Uh, so when you use a runtime, it is definitely a slowdown. But also, there are many techniques to accelerate that. But those have like security, like implications. For example, the AOT or JIT compilation. Uh, so there are there are methods to help mitigate it, mitigate those like the SFI, the software fault isolation. Uh, we actually have a previous paper discussing about this technique called re reusable enclaves. If you want, if you're interested, you can check those check those out. Uh, so so these methods can be used to help, but they have a cost on the performance or the security or the security. Uh, so this is this this is a trade off. Uh, so that basically concludes our uh, our talk, and we plan to open source this stuff. Uh, so the source code will be available after uh, the whole thing get published. You can check in the meantime. You can check our homepage. And thank you. And I'd like to take your questions. That was a great talk. Thanks for all of that. Um, everybody's welcome to pop off of mute and ask questions or, or drop questions into IM, and I'll I'll try to keep an eye on that. Uh, to get us started, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, describing again how the consumer program is sandboxed uh, in in a way that it's it's preserving the the intent of the policies. Uh, so basically, the the consumer program is like it's a uh, it's compiled into the runtime language, for example, WebAssembly language. Uh, so it's going to be hosted in the runtime, and the runtime itself uh, can have all the I/O like completely taken control over because you know the 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 consumer program must go through the runtime to output anything. Uh, so so we can so what we're going to do is that uh, we're going to disallow it to output using like regular APIs like F write or these stuff like write or read. We disallow it to do that. It has to go through our our output pipeline to actually output anything. So by doing that, we can ensure that no matter like what kind of like like computation you may want inside the inside the sandbox, so you can do that. You can do whatever computation you may want. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you want to output anything, you need to go through the output pipeline. You need to go through the policy checks. I see. I see. That's clear to me now. Thank you. And for the WebAssembly runtime, I'm familiar with um, the Wammer uh, micro mm -hmm. runtime that's enabled for SGX. Is that right. what you just use here, or you found a, a different yeah, we runtime? Use, we use the uh, micro runtime. We use the Wammer. OK, great. It's always fun to see new uses of that pop up. Mm -hmm. Catherine? Um, yeah, great talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question with regard to the overhead. Um, so I would um, think that the overhead of remote attestation should be mm -hmm. small compared to the actual training, right? We expect, like, for people who are willing to go through all of this, they must have. Uh, you know, pretty big models to to train. So, um, right. I think the uh, I would be more worried about the uh, overhead coming from the runtime having to enforce the the policy. So, can you elaborate a little bit more about the overhead um, of the runtime? Um, it's like twenty percent, like the best we can do. Um, what's your um, you know uh, outlook of uh, the 
the, the, the eventual runtime, how, how much can we optimize that? Uh, uh, right, so... The security. Mm -hmm. Right. So for the fir first question, I heard that you you're worried about the runtime policy part. Uh, so, uh, so what we what we're gonna do is that inside the runtime you can do whatever you want. There's no policy enforcing you inside the runtime inside the sandbox. So you can do whatever you want. So there's no policy check when you do the computation inside the sandbox because the sandbox you can't do anything else. So the policy check is being enforced on the input side and on the output side. So after all the data's policy. That, so the policy check happens before you start training anything. So, so when that policy check is done, so that you are allowed to access the data set, then you can do whatever you want inside the sandbox. Uh, so it, another policy check will happen on the output side. So that means when you after you train everything, when you output the model, there will be also be a one time a one shot policy check. Uh, but during the computation, there's no policy check, so there's no overhead on the policy side. Uh, but for the runtime set side, which is quite basically similar to what you would expect from like Python. So basically most of those computation heavy stuff are ported as native libraries. So like for example, the, the level next, which is a machine learning library. So it's ported as native library. So it, it exposes API calls to the runtime. What the runtime is going to do is to call those, those API calls. Uh, to actually run the real like computation workload. So what we what we believe is it's not going to be a huge overhead. Which if you look at his like the overhead is quite slow. It's quite low. So it's not not like a lot of runtime overhead here. But it's like if you really just want, if you have to, so if if you have to like like have the entire library as a compiled into like 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 a a web assembly code. Uh, what's going to happen is that it's going to have around 20 to 30 percent of overhead if you are using AOT mode. So that is actually still the code is compiled into native, uh, but into like an like a specific format of native code. If you have really have to use bytecode interpretation, it's going to be two times slower. But that's what you would expect if you want to do that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And I see a question in the chat. Given the code will be open source, uh, what we can do to help people connect with it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. But the first time, is, the first thing is that we, we're going to have to publish it before we actually open source it. Uh, so it's going to be open source at in, in our, in our like, so it's going to be, so I, I plan to open source it with GPO, with GPO. Uh, so it's going to benefit the open source communities and we we can definitely discuss contributing it to to like foundations if they are love if they love to maintain it uh, because I'm just a PhD student so I'm definitely not a so I definitely not, cannot just like do everything by myself so we can discuss we can discuss that obviously yeah sure thanks I was I was dropping that in the chat for Fritz and and others to think about uh, we are first and foremost an open source organization. Uh, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we just necessarily, you know, take in code that that wouldn't be maintained by others, but we can help grow communities around code bases, and mm -hmm. um, uh, we might want to do a little bit of brainstorming, not just for your project, but for other academic projects that maybe don't want a, a permanent home in the CCC, but we can still help uh, get eyeballs on the the code that you've produced. Yeah. Sure. And I see. Sure. Uh, yeah, Chandra, let's go to the right hand. Yeah, so uh, question I have is in terms of the user data that was pulled into the model, is mm -hmm. that uh, stored, encrypted on the persistent media and then pulled in, uh, or is it like stored in the clear text and then you pull it into the model uh, as you read the data, you encrypt the data with the uh, key. Uh, that part was not uh, clear to me. If you can. Uh, uh, so it. the data is going to be encrypted in this payload. So it, it's it's being it's being encrypted all the way until it gets to side. And after the remote attestation, once you got the key, you can decrypt it to get the actual data. Okay. So. 
the source data when it is read into the program it is in the clear text or is it in the in the encrypted text it's in a cipher text oh. so what so it goes it goes the into the right mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and if I remember correctly, you said something about file write, uh, not 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 doing regular file write. Can you expand a little bit on that? I'm not doing what? Pardon me. I I thought you said uh, you won't be. How do you how do you store the data after the model has learned, and uh, you know you have to store the data. How do you store that, making sure it is encrypted? Uh, so the data is going to be the data is going to be packed into the policy attached data like we said it's encrypted so we actually we don't care how you store the data you can put it on the thumb drive you can put it in the cloud because it's, it's encrypted you can put it wherever you want okay thank you mm -hmm. okay great and i think that takes us to the end of the time that we have for questions Thanks again for the great presentation, Shishuan, and the the we'll look forward to seeing the cool code that comes with it. Uh, well, thanks, thanks so much. Also to you. Thanks also to Professor Lin for uh, helping to organize this talk and and supporting the work. Thank you. And let us know uh, if there's things that we can do to help uh, advertise the the research and the code as as you get that out there. All right, so that was that was a great talk, and now we all can take a deep breath and kind of clear our minds out for a different but equally interesting topic um, from uh, Patrick Hukster. Yep, thank you. Let's see if I can get this thing up and running. Um... Oh boy, I'm afraid I might have to restart again because of some permissions on my computer. I thought I've been through this 10 times with Zoom, but apparently not. Let's see, can I do it on the fly? Yeah, I'll have to reopen, sorry, I'll be back in a minute. No problem. Uh, so to save myself some typing in chat, I was going to reply to Fritz that, yeah I, I, yeah, I definitely get that a lot of these academic projects, once it's published, the, the code's probably not going to be maintained. So I don't necessarily think it's always a good fit to bring those projects in as CCC projects. But I kind of wonder, like, if we were to have, like, an academic page that had pointers to uh, projects that fit within our charter, if that would be useful. Yeah, and, and I agree that this would be useful, especially since if I remember back to I think 2018 or 19 in that area, there were some GitHub pages by just some enthusiasts gathering all papers on SGX, for example, and all projects on SGX, just like a bundle of information, which was nice mm -hmm. so that you didn't have to kind of control F through all of the recent <laughs> conferences uh, just to figure out what has been has been out there. Um, so kind of like a database, sort of of like a very lenient database, right? Of papers and or projects and or things would be, I think, why not, right? Uh, like a Wikipedia style uh, collection of TE related stuff. I, I, that would be great. Yeah, I, I I don't see any reason why not why that wouldn't be useful for people. Okay. So that's a thumbs up and a hand. Go ahead. <laughs> so we don't mean to interject. So can everyone see my screen now? Does it work? Yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the conversation. If you had something that you wanted to wrap up. No, no, we were uh, we were just filling time with uh, uh, just some concluding thoughts about what we might do with with some of the academic projects. So the floor is yours. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Patrick Eugster, and I'm a full professor at the Università della Svizzera Italiana 
that's how we call it, um, Uzi here in Lugano, Switzerland. Uh, I have a couple of my um, co-authors here with me today, so I brought my posse in case I, I need backup um, for any pesky detail technical questions. Um, yeah, let, let me dive right into um, the talk then. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, We've we've witnessed this what I call the rise of the trusted execution environment. Um, we've seen after over a decade of work using just plain software solutions that um, these are not good enough for protecting data that's in use, and so it's a natural and necessary evolution to see this hardware support coming up, um, and it's very welcome. Um, yeah, again, we we've kind of failed with software only. And this has been shown recently through a um, study of, of data breaches showing that uh, a large number of data breaches um, are connected or, or involve data that is in the cloud. So that's definitely alarming and it shows we haven't been able to do um, enough here. So yeah, I think needless to say, we can all agree uh, standard encryption is, is good for data in transit and data um, at rest, but not data in use. And it's great also to see all these different uh, platforms, these different options, uh, starting of course with Intel SGX, the original, but then AMD following up um, ARM, CCA, Trust Zone, AWS you know, rolling its own, Intel doubling down with a new platform, and recently NVIDIA with a first kind of trusted GPU. Um, and um, yeah, so it gives us a great number of options to choose from which is great, but having a lot of options can also be problematic because that brings you to the question, which one do you choose or which ones? Um, I'm gonna elaborate on, on that shortly. Um, before I do so though, uh, I, I, I'm probably gonna get killed for this, but I, I do it over and over again. Still, I, I think we're sometimes a little bit too quick at dismissing software solutions. So you know, homomorphic encryption, um, there's some, some nice works out there um, that are practical, that are useful. Um, and the reason also why I'm saying software in general is that we have to face it. I mean, we need software in any case, or at least the context that we're coming from, which is distributed data processing in an untrust environment like the cloud. It's great to have these TEs, these fortresses on individual nodes that can protect the data in use. But if we're doing distributed computations, then we still have to pass data back and forth between them. So what connects these things is software. And we still have to do things such as establishing uh, keys uh, and so on. So we have still a number of software um, crypto solutions that, that we're using anyway, or that we need to use anyway, at least at the present. There's also other advantages to software-based solutions. I mean, they're, they're easy to inspect. I can look at the code. I know what it's doing. I can't say as much for a hardware uh, platform, sorry to say. Um, of course, I don't get something like remote attestation immediately with software. So I don't know for sure that that's the software that's actually then running. Um, but if that's the case, and if I can control the deployment, then software is relatively easy to deploy. Um, worst case, I, I rewrite it in a different programming language or adapt it to some libraries and usually it runs. So there's some advantages definitely on the software side. And, and also, as I'll show shortly, in some scenarios, it, it can be actually competitive uh, on the side of performance still. So again, there's there's a number of different hardware solutions. And, and again, by no means, I don't want to dismiss this. Uh, in quite the contrary, we rely on these heavily, so it's great to have them. Um, but yeah, there there's substantial differences between them. Um, and, and I'm sure you're all familiar with these. I mean, it starts with the basic features and functionalities, how to use them, the APIs, uh, what are the exact features that that they provide? Um, there was a nice paper that gave some overview of these um, features and how they differ. And then, of course, the exact guarantees that we're getting, you know, by and large, uh, confidentiality uh, of data and integrity and, and confidentiality of, of computation. But yeah, there's there's some fine grain, uh, there's some fine print, and, and also rarely are these guarantees really, really precisely defined. Um, so it's also just very difficult to compare them to begin with. Um, and then along with these, there's known attacks uh, for all of these TEEs. And again, this is not to um, this diminish, diminish them or their contributions or pit them one against the other, but it, it's just a fact that there's no bulletproof solution. And, and so this still you know, doesn't really help 
in, in choosing any one particular solution. And then the other thing that I mentioned, which is efficiency or, or performance. So coming from the, uh, the um, use case of data analytics um, that I'll elaborate on a little bit more shortly, we ran some, or actually ran many, many very simple micro benchmarks. Here I'm showing some using a number of well-known data processing operations, SQL style, filtering, selection, projections, so th those kinds of things. And originally we, we wanted to just get an idea of um, how the different trusted execution environments fare. But again, the goal here is not to say this one is better than that other. Um, and then in the mix, we also threw in some partially amorphic encryption to see how, how that performs. And we're actually quite surprised originally to realize that homomorphic encryption can be quite fast. As you see here, we have these nine different operators and we have latency for, for these micro um, queries running in, in logarithmic scale on the Y scale. And the green parts are essentially the, the homomorphic encryption um, ones. And so you can see, if you look just at these green bars compared to the other three respective bars next to them for each of these operators that on, on average, um, and this is averaging over, I don't remember, 100 uh, runs or something. On, on average, they're, they're actually faster. But having said that, or, and, and the explanation for that, for those who may wonder, is, is relatively simple, is that, again, we're in this perspective of distributed computation. So data comes in over the network, um, which is, and it's encrypted. It has to be encrypted. We're, in this case, we're using AES uh, GCM. So it first has to be decrypted in an enclave. Then it can be processed on. Then it has to be encrypted to be sent out to the next node uh, where the same thing then happens. Whereas if you're using partially homomorphic encryption or homomorphic encryption, then your data is already encrypted and assuming it is the right encryption that supports, of course, the operation that's being performed, which is the case here, otherwise we couldn't report it, then you know, you just get your data and you perform your operation and you're done and you send it off and there's no decryption or encryption. And, and that explains the difference. However, of course, things are uh, much more complicated. Look at them in more detail. And so if you see the uh, mauve or, or purple parts that we added here, that is uh, that is the decryption time at the end of a, say, a query. So if you're not just looking at individual operations, but you're you're running a query which consists in several such operations and stages, you're, you're lining them up. Then the last one, you have to decrypt your your result um, for the user, right? And if you're using something like homomorphic encryption, then a lot of these schemes are are very expensive on the decryption side. And so once you add that, then um, in fact, in many cases, trusted execution environments become more efficient, right? But that would be for typically this this last operation. Right, so you really have to have a closer look at what is it that you're doing with with what kind of data also uh, to to understand just plain performance wise and just in this case say focusing on what they would have as a common denominator in terms of guarantees, which is confidentiality of the data, um, which one you would you would want to prefer just from that plain performance side. Of course, again, the guarantees um, would also have to be taken into account, right? And then the other side of things. Um, at least as far as I know, currently there's uh, no single trusted execution environment product that is deployed in all the three major clouds at, at this point in time. Um, Amazon has its Nitro, uh, Azure, um, SGX and SCV, I believe, and same thing for, for Google Platform, Cloud Platform. But so if, if I as an individual want to write a piece of software already, uh, I have to ask myself the question in which uh, Google or in which cloud do I want to run, run this software? Um, and so that that just leads to this big problem, at least for us, for me as an academic, um, how to choose which one to choose of these trusted execution environments, because you know, guarantee wise, they're definitely stronger um, than than these software alternatives. And also, how to reconcile now if I want to build a system that can run in different clouds, or maybe even um, God forbid, at some point, uh, start some query in an edge data center using one of these TEEs and then move the data after pre-filtering and pre-processing into a cloud data center using another mechanism. So needing some kind of interoperability. How would I even reconcile the guarantees that I'm getting from these different um, um, uh, possibilities that I have, these different mechanisms, if I want to combine them or, or put them together somehow? Um, and yeah, that's without even considering the software solutions and other accelerators like, like uh, trusted GPUs. Um, that are now on the market. Um, so yeah, how to address all these questions? So 
At this point, we decided to not panic. Let's take a step back and, and really figure out what are the requirements that we have. Um, and so this maybe gives a little bit more of perspective. How do we even arrive at this point? So this is an overview of, of work that we've done over the years. And it's actually great to see some of the co-authors among the audience here, some, some Purdue alumni. I used to be a professor at Purdue um, for about a decade. So we, I would claim my group was the first to really look at uh, generic data analytics using a scalable distributed backend. So originally this was MapReduce, that was a while ago, of course the thing is, is outdated. And so then we moved on to other systems, Spark, which I'll touch upon a little bit more shortly, and then also stream processing um, in the context of the Apache Storm system um, and so on. All right, but so when while we're doing this work and, and also in hindsight, reflecting on that work, we were trying to come up with what are requirements that that we have here. And so we, we came up with this fourfold requirement. We dubbed this the, the site requirements. And the first one is obvious, it's security. You know, we want uh, strong security. But for us, it became quickly apparent that also a little bit looking at um, industrial solutions that talk is cheap and everything is claimed to be secure, this secure that. So really one has to be looking at the at, at the detail. Um, and, and once one does that, then I think it becomes clear that formally defined guarantees that are formally verified become of interest um, here, at least to us from, from the academic perspective. Um, the second requirement, which um, comes out from this um, you know, difficulty of choosing is is this we want to be independent from any specific platform at least as an academic I can't just hire another team of, of 10 developers to port my systems to the next uh, hardware platform that that comes out um, so that we want to be as independent as possible from any security mechanism uh, we want to be transparent again from the perspective of a data processing system like a data analytics system um, I think it's pretty clear that the end user is typically not an expert programmer. Um, and if they're good at programming, then probably not uh, an expert in security. Um, so, you know, they shouldn't at every query have to reason about security constraints that should be taken care of by someone who's an expert and, and kind of, you know, once and for all, or at least not at the level of every single um, query. And then finally, of course, performance um, is, is key here. If we come up with solutions that have, I don't know, send, say still 10 times slow down over the same execution without any security guarantees, unfortunately, still a lot of users are rather going to put the money in the piggy bank in case there is a data breach, which costs them something. And in the meantime, just save money and not spend as much money running their stuff in the cloud using fewer instances, fewer cycles, and so on. And, and I think it's, I mean, these may be trivial to everyone, these requirements, but I, I don't remember seeing a lot of works where they explicitly put them down and and also really just reflecting on can we achieve all four of them and it's pretty obvious that a subset can be achieved quite easily we have plenty of um demonstrations of that systems that exist in academia and and out there in the industrial world but but really getting all four to the fullest extent is is a, a really daunting task and so this is where i come back to the the title of the talk Though this is our approach, we believe that formal programming techniques can really help bring these four together and and cover the four um, all uh, all four of these together. Um, and I've I've been <laughs> urged to not uh, become too formal, and so I'm going to try to stick to these few uh, Greek letters or symbols that you see here, um, and not have too many or many more of those. I hope I didn't miss any while editing the slides, um, but I, I'm happy to bring some more. Greek letters later if someone has questions about these things. So concretely, what, is, what does this mean? How did we um, combine these requirements? So let, let's illustrate that through a piece of work that we presented a year ago at, at PLDI or a little bit more, which is the system called Hydra, which is a confidentiality preserving data analytics system for large scale deployment in the cloud built on Apache Spark. So how does it uh, address security? What we provide is a confidentiality guarantee uh, that's based on non-interference, which is a very well-known and, and you know, in the meantime, uh, old concept um, that's been used widely in programming languages to reason about um, confidentiality in detail, also in the meantime for integrity. Um, concretely, this is informed, enforced by a static information flow type system. So before a query starts being executed, it is verified for this guarantee 
And if that doesn't hold, it's not executing, right? So plain and simple. Um, how do we address this independence, uh, platform independence requirement? We're using a also relatively established or, or well-known um, old, I would even say multi-level security policy. So customizable, you have different levels of confidentiality, uh, which are arranged according to a lattice. But we extend that with a mapping of these mechanisms or of these levels to security mechanisms. And I'll illustrate all of these um, in, in detail shortly. So it's a, a relatively, I would say, pragmatic means of, of really involving the user saying, what do you prefer? What do you want? Um, and to some extent of taking responsibility. Um, all of this is um, then based on a, a, or uses a formal query language. Uh, which is a mix of Lambda calculus. Lambdas are widespread currently or these days in programming languages, so it's, it's not that fancy anymore. Um, and a mix with relational algebra. So we have relations that are the basic abstraction on which we perform queries. And then security annotations or abstractions. Um, how do we achieve this transparency? Well, what happens is that users will express their queries in a subset of this language, which doesn't have any of the security annotations or abstractions. And then our system will automatically transform that. So fill in the security annotations based on um, the security policy that I mentioned um, earlier. And we've proven this transformation process to preserve semantics. And again, all of this will be illustrated shortly uh, through some concrete examples. And then finally, once we have a, a formal language uh, that allows us to reason about security in detail, in this case, confidentiality, we can also use it to reason about performance. Um, and as far as this transformation goes, it sounds a little bit spooky. What's the, what's the magic there? We actually also open this up to the user or at least to uh, uh, an advanced experienced user in that we have a notion of pluggable heuristics that really can then decide which mechanism to use where. And we have a domain specific language that really makes it easy to express these heuristics. And, and again, I'll show examples of these uh, in a few slides. So this is roughly the workflow of our system. The bottom left, the data analyst would write their, their query um, in our prototype based on Spark. This would be in Spark SQL, unmodified Spark SQL. And then the query would be transformed here using the security policy that I mentioned, which would be uh, the duty of a security expert to e express. And of course, over time, it can change. Then uh, the data schema would be annotated by the data owner or the data manager, probably together with a security expert to decide which data is at which confidentiality level. And then finally, uh, the security expert with what we may call a performance engineer, someone who understands the, the, the performance side of things, would write or choose a heuristic that would then drive the transformation which then leads to this annotated query with all the security annotations that is then compiled and optimized. And as part of that, it's verified against for these guarantee, this guarantee that we want to provide before it's then executed. So this is the only part here, the executor that would happen in an untrusted environment like the cloud um, or data center, uh, an edge data center or both. Um, we also, in some cases, rely on some limited resources back on the side of the data analyst or, or the, the user. So we may use some trusted on-premise computing resources in some rare case, but the rest of it would exploit something like SGX or whatever is available based on the security policy um, that then drove the transformation. And that would happen then automatically, right? So at the, the point here, uh, final execution plan, the query is transformed, all the code is added to use the security mechanisms to bridge the gap between the different nodes, make sure stuff is, stays encrypted at all time and so on. And then the, the result finally to the bottom right, that would then go back to the left to the data analyst. So simple security policy. I mean, we all have seen these in, in, uh, in, in classes in, in, in textbooks, relatively straightforward. Here, a simple example of multi-level security policy with three levels, public data, let's say low uh, secret data and high secret data. And then here, the second step, this mapping that I mentioned, in, which assigns the security mechanisms to uh, the levels of this policy. So here, for instance, we will be saying, uh, data that is at the level high secret can be um, operated on or used in the client domain without being encrypted, or it can be used and, and operated on within SGX. 
without being also further encrypted. Um, or for data at the low level, we allow the um, cloud uh, to operate on that data as long as it is encrypted or to use that data as long as it encrypted with any of these um, encryption schemes, right? And then finally, as I mentioned here, the, the data is annotated with the labels relatively um, straightforward. These are two tables taken from the TPCH benchmark, which we're gonna use then later for evaluation. So here the data owner uh, would just add these labels, low, high, et cetera. And then these security annotations or the security um, part here would just be inferred automatically based on the security policy and uh, based for a given query and the given heuristic that is is going to be um, transforming the query. So it's not it's not really part of the the data um, schema. Right. So here's a high level um, um, some example of, of a query that's being transformed. This is in our formal core language. So I could show you an example. I, I should have probably put that, which is in concrete Spark SQL syntax. It's really fairly close, but I, you know we don't have to go through it in detail. Suffice to say, at a high level, we're aggregating some stuff that's coming out of a filter where previously we created the cross or we joined two relations. One was this table customers and one was this other table orders that you saw on the previous slide after some filtering, right? So this would be plain, a plain vanilla query expressed by the user. And then all this stuff here, these annotations, this part would be running in SGX. Um, here we're using AESGCM for encryption. Uh, encryption and decryption uh, as needed would be all inserted automatically when the, the query is transformed. Um, a little bit more in, de in detail, how does the system then work? I mean, it's nice to de declare at a high level which mechanism to use, but then how does the part really get deployed using that mechanism? So we have a, a rich library here um, that allows us to declare or, or to um, write, say, plugins for different mechanisms. So for trusted execution environments, for instance, they can be inserted as native trusted execution environments. So that's kind of the case uh, of what we have with SGX, where we wrote a custom interpreter that we're running because we can't just drop an entire virtual machine in there as easily. But for more recent um, platforms, you know, that there's that possibility. So the, the user could write here, this is a Scala trait, could implement this trait. Uh, kind of, you can think of it as a, as a wrapper uh, to really en encompass the code that it takes to to then deploy something um, from the uh, analytics platform inside such an instance, right? And then similarly for the encryption schemes, we have different uh, traits that one can implement to use uh, to wrap existing encryption schemes. And then on the heuristic side, similarly, we have a relatively rich API to describe these heuristics. These are kind of just the basic types. And I apologize here, there's some, there's this term Scylla or this name that pops up that's really just the follow-up of, of the Hydra work. So it, it is the kind of the next version of the system. So uh, we're really talking about the same thing here, but because I took these code snippets from, from actual code, the, you know, we have the new names in there in some places. But yeah, much simpler, I mentioned earlier, we have a domain specific language for describing these transformation heuristics and, and without going into too much detail. Here, the one to the right, that was the original heuristic that we used in, in Hydra, which mixes partially homomorphic encryption schemes together with SGX in a relatively simple way. If you remember those micro benchmarks where we determined that certain operators are faster using this or that. So that's essentially what we're using here. For every operation that's performed as part of a query, we just look at essentially uh, a table that we have from, from those micro benchmarks, which just says which mechanism is expected to be faster for that operation. And then that one is chosen with one simple uh, exception to the rule, which is that, as you remember, if you have this partially homomorphic encryption based operation at the end, you have potentially an expensive decryption to pay. So we avoid that scenario by just saying, we start typically off with partially homomorphic encryption, but once, for instance, we have a limitation of what the encryption scheme can do in terms of the operation, once we switch over to SGX for the remainder of the query or for the next stage, we never ever go back to homomorphic encryption, right? So it's kind of a one-way street. Um, and then, in fact, we have this much simpler heuristic here, the top left, which is really just flipping back and forth. Whatever is just 
locally for that given operation that's being considered expected to be faster, that's the one that we're going to use, right? And, and again, this heuristic is applied before the query is run, right? So it's not something that we do currently dynamically. We could introduce some dynamic checks and decide on the fly, but currently this is all static. So the implementation, I mentioned already, uh, our system is built on Apache Spark. Uh, it's used through the original um, Spark C SQL API. We leverage the Catalyst Extensible Query Optimizer. Um, and in the meantime, so this these numbers here on the lines of code that we modified are pretty outdated. Um, for the, the new version that I mentioned of the system called um, Scylla, we've gone in and done some much deeper um, changes, uh, much more substantial changes in particular to the runtime system to be able to, to really uh, enforce security um, at all these interactions between nodes. So these are, are not really up to date anymore. The current status, we've tested and evaluated this in, in three major clouds, AWS, Azure, and, and Google Cloud Platform. Uh, we currently support four, well, I'd say we really support three hardware mechanisms. We support um, SGX, SCV, and Nitro. Uh, we're working on TDX. I wouldn't say it's really uh, mature yet. It's as, in terms of an academic program, it's mature, but you know what that, that means. Um, and, and then we currently have these uh, six partially homomorphic encryption schemes that we support, and we're working on uh, integrating two more of our own, which we designed, which are, are symmetric, of course, then providing weaker guarantees, but, but uh, very, very improved performance. So let's look at some uh, results here. So I mentioned already the TPC benchmark, which is a standard benchmark in the data analytics space. And we chose also so that we can compare to two, which at the time were the state-of-the-art systems, uh, which also were evaluated using those benchmarks. The first one being Cuttlefish, which was our, our own system, which was using partial homomorphic encryption uh, inside Spark, so that it's a fair comparison. Uh, and exceptionally um, could be configured to exceptionally use SGX for, um, for overcoming limitations of partial homomorphic encryption. So essentially re-encrypting the, the data. Um, but in this case, we 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 have this fallback also, which we're also using uh, with Hydra of going back to the client side and re-encrypting data uh, there. And the other system we're comparing against is opaque, or at least uh, an early version. I'm probably you're all familiar uh, with that. Um, and, and we're comparing against those systems using our system, but in, in either case, we're just using the mechanisms that the corresponding system also supports. So in case of Cuttlefish, that's home encryption. In case of opaque, it's SGX. And the goal here was really just to see, are we kind of competitive, right? Because we have a much more generic system. Uh, there may be levels of indirection. And we we're actually happy to see that, no, that that's not the case. We can actually keep up uh, with these. We have substantial uh, speed ups over opaque, but you know, I'm sure their system has improved in the meantime. There's They were using different libraries for SGX than we were using and so on. So, but again, that was not the goal really. It was just to see, can we, can we keep up? Um, the more interesting part for, for us was this Hydra hybrid version. So here, I mentioned this earlier simple heuristic. We just said, okay, what if we now try to mix it up between SGX and partial homomorphic encryption? And here, you know, we were able to show significant improvements over our same system, but in each case, using just one of these mechanisms or classes of mechanisms uh, without the other. So that was kind of encouraging for us. Like, yeah, there is a there may be a scenario where you want to uh, mix in software um, for performance purposes. Um, here's some later numbers yet from this um, new prototype uh, or new system version that I mentioned, Scylla. So here we were first and foremost interested in how do the different uh, trusted execution environments compare against each other um, in our system. So definitely a disclaimer here, right? This is the way we use them in our system. I already mentioned SGX has an interpreter inside in our case, the others are we deploying uh, containers in them. So it's definitely different levels of, of abstraction, which will have different impact or have impact on the performance, also on trusted compute base. So um, all with a grain of salt, right? Um, and, and then, yeah, you know, how do you compare a node that has uh, support for SCV against a node that has support for SGX? So we tried to find uh, comparable, let's say uh, specifications but yeah, the the goal was not to you know say this one is faster than the other. But you can see that in our case, at least the SGX version 
is significantly faster. But again, that is because you know that the code is is running um, that we're running in there is is really customized, highly heavily customized, and, and it only contains what we need in there. Uh, so that makes substantial difference. The other two, it's kind of a wash between uh, SEV and and um, and uh, and nitro, right? Um, yeah, and, and the the um, the difference to to SGX is also due to this uh, encryption and decryption when entering and, and exiting enclaves. That in the case of SEV and Nitro is taking place in in Java. It's implemented in Java. In the case of of SGX, we're running the C code, so uh, definitely um, improving there. And we could probably improve things on the other platforms as well using the Java native interface, for instance. And then this most interesting part for us was was this heuristic. And so here we took these two heuristics that I showed earlier, these two slightly different ones, uh, because we're interested in you know how much difference does that make. Uh, and so we were comparing what we call SGX plus PHE star, which was the, the a little bit lengthier heuristic, if you remember, um, a little bit more complex one to the much simpler one, which we call SGX plus PHE. Um, and in fact, it turns out that that um, latter one, the simpler one is significantly faster uh, on average than than the the more complex one. The reason being that again, how much that that additional overhead for decryption in the case of homomorphic encryption uh, weighs in depends on which operations um, you are looking at. So there were still a number of a good number of operations where, despite that decryption overhead, which we all also have with a trusted execution environment, the homomorphic encryption version was still faster. So this kind of simpler, much simpler heuristic of just you know looking locally at every operation and then deciding where to deploy that or which mechanism to use to secure that was performing uh, better. And uh, if you remember correct, if you remember roughly the, the, the size of that heuristic was like 10 lines in our domain specific language. Um, so very simple, uh, very easy to write uh, at least basic heuristics there and, and modify them. All right. So um, I hope I convinced you um, of, of the approach in general. There's a lot more work to be done. We're looking into mechanizing the, the proofs of our guarantees the same way it's easy. It's easy to say that something is secure. It's easy to write a paper with you know, some proof that, that something is secure. Um, is it really secure? So you know, here the goal is to take it to the next level, use uh, um, interactive theorem improving to, to really verify the framework. Of course, you don't know whether the theorem proof is correct, but you know, the, I think the, the bar is being increased um, and that, that is the goal. Um, we're continuously looking at new mechanisms that we can add to our system and support in there. We're looking at a number of extensions, uh, generalizations, refinements. Of course, we want to add integrity guarantees. We want to do differential privacy because that's the thing these days. Um, and it, it's really, uh, it makes a lot of sense in practice. We're also looking at alternate uh, data flow models or systems. So data analytics, Spark style is, is an interesting thing, but there's others. Um, in our case, for instance, we're considering all data belongs to one party. So what happens if we're combining data from different users? What's happening if we're looking at something like uh, more real-time online processing, stream processing rather than batch processing? Uh, so these are all things that that we're looking at um, from coming from, again, this simple perspective of try to use formal programming techniques to bring these things together. All right. That... I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have or delegate to um, my um, ha happy helpers that are online with me. <laughs> that was a great talk and formal methods are, are certainly um, on the upswing and I, I see sort of required in, in more and more places now. So it's it's great to, to see this work here. Um, as with the previous talk, feel free to, to pop off of mute. We're not terribly formal about this and ask questions. Uh, one, one thought that came to mind um, is we rely on attestation uh, mm -hmm. to know that we're interacting with the thing that we think we're interacting with. Can, can you draw a connection for me between the verification that you do here and uh, remote attestation? The two are... are at least so far not connected. So the, the verification that we do is really, at least in the system that I present our systems, it's really based on confidentiality. 
uh, of data, and we're kind of trusting the deployment environment to deploy the right thing. Um, yeah, understandably, obviously, there's guarantees that we get with trusted execution environments that we don't get with software-based mechanisms. Um, having said that, um, we've done in the past, in my group, work on software-based uh, remote attestation for wireless networks uh, using things like uh, time-slotted communication, so where you can get really synchrony or, or timeout guarantee, so you can really you know, bound the time that someone could, say, compute uh, a hash to hide up their traces or hide the fact that they're, that it's a different piece of software that's being deployed. Uh, and I think some of that could be applicable here, but it's it's definitely, I'm going out on limb here. We haven't done the, the research yet. Um, but yes, we are we are limited in terms of the guarantees that, that we are providing. Okay, thank you. I'm kind of curious, you mentioned really early in your paper that um, you're comfortable with published open source software because you can review the software and kind of see what it's doing. And mm -hmm. you called out that, that that's just not possible with hardware, but I kind of wanted to challenge that assumption a little bit. Um, do you believe that it might be possible? And I, I know this is kind of underneath the layer that this paper was presented at, but since you presented it, I, I wanted to challenge it a little bit. Um, do you believe it's possible to review hardware designs in one and in a way that's similar to the way that one reviews open source software and reason about the confidentiality guarantees that are implemented in the hardware? For sure, but I, I think then the problem becomes similar to attestation, right? Then if you give me a, a particular chip Right. Do I know that that one actually is according to the specification? I know that there's been some works going in that direction also, uh, but admittedly, I'm not an expert here, so I wouldn't know. But I, I know that I can, I can not kind of pry open a chip and then see, okay, is, is this pin connected to that one ever or not? Um, yeah. Right, and I think that's that's gets back to what Dan was just talking about attestation, and that's a that's a completely separate parallel topic. Yeah, so I'll, yeah. I'll I'll leave that there. But super super interesting paper. Thanks for thanks for this, and obviously formal proofs are are very much needed in this field. Thank you. And and again, I'm, I'm in, I I understand my limitations on on the side of hardware. So I'm, I'm I am coming from this at this from kind of an application side, um, and um you know I'm happy for all feedback that I can get from the hardware side on this. It's the exact same problem. I mean, what you said, how do I look at a bunch of code if I'm a hardware designer? How do I look at a bunch of lines of code? And you mentioned, you know, thousands of lines of code and reason about whether or not it's providing any security guarantees. It's the same thing when you look at a tape out uh, for a, you know, FPGA. It's the exact same thing. Okay, and with that, we have time for maybe one quick question, if if there's another one. Yeah, probably right, talks, 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 talks is a little bit taxing for people. I'm, I'm happy to take questions at any point, you know, just shoot me an email, of course, um, if something comes up later. Okay, great. Um, thanks again to to Professor Eugster and, and your students who joined you and uh, the colleagues. It's uh, great to have the talk today. Thanks a lot. Great being here. <clears throat> okay, uh, our next topic is uh, from Ab and the uh, Brand Repositioning Working Group. Uh, Ab did send a note to the list yesterday so some of you may have some context for this, but uh, I'll let uh, Ab reintroduce things here. Sure, thanks Dan, and thanks everyone for giving us uh, some of your of the tax time today. Um, so uh, there's uh, Rachel Wan and Julian Stephen from IBM and myself as representative of the uh, Confidential Computing Brand Repositioning uh, Working Group. This is uh, uh, across multiple uh, uh, members of the CCC, our participants from the outreach committee mainly, but also from other, from GRC, from out, uh, the TAC as well. Uh, this was tasked by the governing board to uh, ad adapt the messaging uh, that we have today for confidential computing uh, with the evolving 
ecosystem. So uh, that's the purpose of it. So we're basically seeking input. Uh, today, uh, one of the streams we have basically is defining uh, use cases where confidential computing can help or will be relevant to, to uh, enable uh, the ecosystem for business opportunities and so on. And uh, we're seeking actually feedback today on the secure supply chain, oh, securing the supply chain, uh, both software and hardware. So Julian has prepared some, some slides to walk us through. So uh, that's the context. So Julian, if you wanna take it away. Oh, sure. So let me quickly share here. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. So like I mentioned, um, we've been kind of working on um, working on putting together uh, a guide with the, with the intention of doing the um, as part of the brand repositioning working group. So um, as the as a members here may be aware, so we have been kind of focusing our focus has been evolving away from and raising awareness and you know, what is confidential computing to more of a increasing adoption so why confidential computing matters so towards this we have been looking at how to enable uh, cc use cases uh, can, and how the how this is important for different parties in, um, involved so as, as part of this i think there were like three uh, main items that the uh, working group has been looking at. One is to kind of uh, create this narrative. And then, so that kind of includes creating a kind of messaging guide, highlighting use cases. Um, a second uh, part, part that we were kind of working on is to increasing the visibility. So this includes things like um, outreach, uh, website in improvements, other uh, content optimizations or any analyst engagements and so on. And um, we also want to be uh, very collaborative, right? And then uh, rep have representation from a lot of different organizations um, in this effort. So uh, a bit more specifically, um, what we want to talk about, talk today about, or ask the uh, members here is about the messaging guide. And we are kind of focused on uh, three use cases here. Uh, the first one on using confidential computing for generative AI, uh, and second one for confidential computing for multi-party collaboration, and finally for kind of supply chain. So the uh, our approach has been for each of these use cases identify the audience. So for example, for uh, Gen AI, we can think of cloud service providers, uh, people who 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 want to provide Gen AI. AI as a service or want to host their own. So each of these use case, we would identify an audience. Uh, we would kind of uh, outline the benefits for each of those audience and then kind of provide a solution outline. And same for multi-party collaboration. Uh, so what really want, we wanted to talk about today is this uh, supply chain use case. So um, we would like the expertise and inputs of the committee here on, on guidance on how to proceed with this. So um, is, there, is there any, so I do believe this is one of the priority use cases that, were, that we were tasked with. And we wanted to know if there's a specific scenario with this community is familiar with, the members of this community uh, are experts on. Uh, who would be the ideal audience be for uh, this use case? And uh, there are there are definitely some use cases that we can think of, like supply chain security also involves multiple parties. So any kind of multi-party collaboration scenario is also applicable to uh, supply chain security. Uh, we can also uh, think of using SALSA for confidential computing. So that is also an angle we kind of thought about and also using the attestation capabilities of CC to kind of enable to ensure the uh, software stack integrity. So these are the different ideas that we had kind of come up with, but we did want to uh, put the question out there, um, asking is there something specific that uh, the community would like us to focus on or uh, are there uh, more additional research materials available to uh, leverage upon? So let me kind of pause there. Uh, Rachel, uh, please feel free to add anything here. And um, yeah, so this is essentially a, a ask to the all the members here.
Uh, hello? Yeah. Um, I can sort of initialize stuff. Uh, sometimes uh, it takes a little bit to get people. Sure, uh, sure, yeah. I, I'm just curious if I'm sharing the right screen here. I, uh, I hope you can see. Yes, uh, is that your bank account info? Is that what you wanted to show? <laughs> it's like you have an overdraft. I sure, I sure hope not. <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, so. Go um, ahead, please, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. I would love to get your feedback and also um, this committee's feedback on the supply chain security use case for competition computing. Yeah, I, th I think there's going to be a mix of things that that span from what we already have in play that there is probably a lot of examples of, and then um, the potential that's that's sort of untapped, and and both of those things surrounds the ability to strongly identify artifacts using attestation. So on, on the sort of first side of the scale of things that we already have, um, you know, that's typically the, the, uh, um, the, the attestations that people already use today for the artifacts that they themselves produce um, and kind of thinking about what things could look like in the future it's pretty. It's become pretty common practice for, um, for most software packaging sites to provide uh, a hash of the software that they're providing or, or provide a, a signed artifact. Uh, and so, drawing a connection between that hash and a, a hash that's part of an attestation, or can be linked to an attestation through uh, a chain of hashes. Uh, would be sort of that idea of something that we could foresee happening across the, the software ecosystem. So this would primarily be to kind of ensure that the software stack in uh, CVM would be um, uh, verified, right? It would be uh, kind of, so I'm kind of curious to, uh, understand how would that be different from a typical CVM attestations versus a supply chain specific uh, a usage, so to speak. I think it's who's who's advertising it. So, like if you've okay. built your own CVM, you know your expected measurements. Uh, but typically, we all pull software from a lot of different sources. And so, if I were to go download. Um, I don't know, let's say Eclipse, for example, I haven't checked the Eclipse website recently, but you know, it, it probably would have in, in the past, like an MD5 hash. So I could check the thing that I downloaded actually matched its expected value. Uh, and so if we looked at the stack of software that's involved in, in running a CVM, uh, we would want each supplier of components in that stack to be able to provide those expected measurements. Okay. Okay. I see Chandra uh, patiently has a uh, hand up. Yeah. So in terms of the supply chain and, you know, it's kind of a very broad question. I mean, what I wanted to understand is what is the scope of the information you're looking at? One, is it like the artifacts, like the identity and the measurement artifacts that uh, Dan was talking about? The second is the policy on the verifier side or on the verifier owner side and then um, and then you know uh, continue and then reference endorsement values right uh, reference values so what is the scope of the question you were asking uh, it was not clear to me so uh, I guess the scope essentially is uh, what do what do, what do we think is a uh... Uh, is the strongest use case for us to pitch CC to everyone. So which of those, you mentioned many things, which of those things do we feel is, is it would be the strongest uh, argument for uh, others to adopt CC? So that is that would be the use case that we would want to prioritize first. So if we feel that um, uh, attestations, so that is that is the most compelling argument then we will want to focus there. Oh, okay. If, if I may add, um, sorry, someone else actually had it. Uh, 
like Alex, uh, Alex, you had to. Sure. I'll, I'll just say that I, I think before we can dig in too deeply here, I, and I'm trying to remember for Sal, who was it that um, gave us a tech talk on salsa? It's been a few weeks ago. Dan, I don't know if you happen to remember the, the woman's name um, from Google. Uh, that was a super interesting talk. We probably need to go back and visit that. And I recall her stack went all the way down to, I think, the bootloader for um for linux so it started very very low in the in the stack and went all the way up through all the open source components that went into the bootloader the os any workload that was running inside of the container um i think kind of what was said earlier this is a broad topic we need to scope it down to the different pieces um because some of them might not be owned by the consumer of the of the tea, some of them might be um, imposed on the consumer of the tea by cloud infrastructure. Um, for example, the bootloader or even some uh, paravisor components, and then some are completely up to the application, uh, the 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 owner of the VM that's running applications and loading workload workloads in there. So it'd be cool to see this kind of circled back to that salsa talk and broken out there. Yeah. yeah, and it's the the sort of thing that you're looking at doing is is it trying to direct more and more content that's on the website and that we take to talks to align with with use cases. Yeah, if uh, if I may add uh, basically to that, so um, I can comment on that. So we have different audiences, right? So. There are more that we, we have dependent on the use, like for each use case, so it would be what uh, it could be a business audience or the more technical audience. And then obviously we'll have to adjust the messaging according to uh, you know, the, the, the critical points or the key messages um, to that audience. So what we are trying to do, and that's the mandate we had, is basically to uh, to get a little bit more on the uh, the um, general audience as well as technical, uh, it's it really showing the benefit. What At the end of the day, basically, why should the ecosystem, I'm talking broadly here, of the industry who are interested, who, why should they care about competition computing? What does it bring to them? What, whether it's bottom line or, or that's, that's basically the approach when we say use cases here, it's really user um, and that user could be a, a business uh, executive, it could be a technical leader, um, and obviously we'll adjust the messaging according to that. So I don't know if that helps a little bit or not, but that's kind of the context. Yeah, so I think that we have existing content that might just need to be repackaged and made more visible uh, as well as helping to create new content. So there's been at least two tech talks that we should be able to harness here. So one was the one that uh, Alec was looking for from Diona Glaze at Google. And we can find the, the date for that later, but it was earlier this summer. And then um, in May, we had a tech talk from uh, Chad Kimes and, and Marcella Malara um, about similar topics with Salsa in Toto and uh, CI CD. Uh, so there's content there that we can uh, help bring forward. Sure, that's great. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess today what we were not, we didn't expect like to have <laughs> all answers of you, but yeah, we wanted to sure. introduce the topic and thanks everybody for for giving us time. Um, and actually it's it's an ongoing exercise. We've been started the, the working group for a couple of months now, actually since June uh, formally. And uh, so I think uh, Julian, if you can go to the, like the last slide. So what we did was, uh, uh, we have the document uh, on on the working group Google Drive, uh, and uh, you know I invite everybody uh, please if you can dive into it and uh, add your feedback, thoughts, comments uh, on this use case. And if you have any um, issues with access, you can e either email me, Rachel or or Julian, and we'll make sure that uh, have yeah, it should be open accessible but just in case um so yeah that that that's our ask to to the tag today okay great and would somebody mind dropping that link into the chat and then people 
if we can get a hold of it before they, they forget about it between meetings here. I believe I, I just did, yeah. Great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. And I saw Manu's hand was up. Yeah, I put it down because I didn't want to take too much time right now. Hey, uh, uh, Rachel and Julian, um, sorry, I wish I had bandwidth to contribute to the uh, to the messaging and repositioning. I had to drop off because I'm like too busy. But there is one thing, and I will. I'll try to reach out to you guys, and uh, I should spend some time with you. And and then I know I've, I've. It's been a year that I said I should do a tech talk, but um, I will. I will get to it at some point. There's one thing that is truly uh, unique about uh, confidential computing in the context of supply chain is that um, when you have the ability to create random numbers in a confidential computing environment that shields it from the outside world, what you end up having uh, with that random number, if it's big enough, let's say 256 bit, essentially you create a symmetric key that number only exists uh, in that physical computing environment across the entire universe and will never ever be reproduced a second time, right? Because if it's large enough, uh, the likelihood of it happening again, it's never gonna happen again. So what you have is an inherently authentic digital object. So, and, and it's a, a digital object that is cryptographically useful. You can derive keys, you can encrypt stuff with it and all that. So I think the um, what we're building in our architecture is, is a mechanism by which you can anchor uh, virtually anything. Uh, you can anchor a data that represents entities that can be virtually anything. And then you can stitch them together and create chains of custody, chains of trust, uh, which I think is where the uh, the intersection with supply chains are. You can literally anchor data across virtually any type of entities, across any type of organizations, domains, and all that. Uh, cannot have a super confidential ledger if you want. Uh, I hate, you know, ledger is loaded because of blockchains and all that, but you can have a native hardware-backed uh, confidential ledger, you know, infrastructure that you can build and you can only do it with confidential computing. Uh, if you don't have that hardware protection, if you don't have the attestation, then you don't have any assurance that that cryptographic anchor is, in, is, is, is indeed unique, uh, is indeed protected and cannot be replicated any, anywhere else. So uh, inherent authenticity is I think a property that confidential computing brings in the toolkit of things that we can use to then build su uh, secure su uh, supply chain solutions. So I'll reach out to you guys and, and try to write a few paragraphs uh, about yeah. this. That'd be great, thanks. Yeah, that'd be wonderful, yes. yeah, thanks. Thank you, and then, yeah, if there are any documentations that are um, about the competition computing in the context of supply chain, please feel free to share with us and so we can leverage those contacts and build a messaging guide on top of that. And, and uh, guess... time, some, sometimes things kind of uh, uh, will drift if we don't recognize um, um, uh, like a hard stop on them. Do you have a time frame that you're working under for, for these artifacts? Yeah, right now we're trying to get to is, um, I don't have the timeline in front of me, but uh, we, can, we can share it. Um, it's definitely something we were looking for to get input by, um, I would say mid-October. Um, ideally, um, mm -hmm. so that we can obviously iterate um, and then see what at least, well, I would say if any documentation or material that exists, if you can, if somebody I don't know, could share that with us uh, as soon as possible, um, so we can uh, review with the working group and see what we can, you know, uh, extract from that as, as useful uh, information for the messaging guide. So that's the first ask. Um, in, in the meantime, if by mid-October, uh, we can get uh, gather uh, everybody here's contributions in that document. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to me or Rachel or uh, Julian, obviously, and uh, uh, you know directly or, or through the document directly, you can make comments there. Uh, so these are the two, I would say, kind of next steps I, uh, that I see. Okay, great, thanks.
Okay, so that's what we had yeah. today. Thanks, Julian, and yeah. thanks, Dan, thanks, and everyone. the tag for for giving us time today. Yeah, thank you for everyone's input. All right, uh, we do not have time to get into the the other topic, uh, and I didn't think that we would end up with time for that, but I do want to uh, reintroduce it uh, so that we can pick things back up on the mail list. Uh, which is that uh, Mike was working on a paper about um, attestation business models. And in the course of that, there was a lot of feedback that, that unearthed that there's a lot of terminology that needs better definition from us. And um, <clears throat> some of that we were able to um, sort of redirect to existing work. So the attestation SIG already has an open issue about defining the term workload. And so we've, we've kind of rewarmed that discussion over there, uh, I think last week. And then the one that we wanted to move forward with in this body is to understand better about this, this idea of who's in the trust chain. And I think that the, the subtext here is the original idea that if you've got if you've got this trusted hardware that's deployed into somebody else's infrastructure, you ideally just want to be able to say, oh, I just trust that hardware, and I've completely excluded the the hosting provider from from my concerns. Uh, but I think that we all understand that it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that. So how how do we get to a point that says something more useful to adopters about who they trust? And how can they think about who's inside their, their trust boundary? One way that we can go about doing that is, is trying to list out all of the software uh, sort of related to this supply chain discussion we were just having. Can we actually understand everything that's in the TCB from a software perspective and at least understand you know, maybe a finite set of vendors that you're relying on? Um, and, and there's a couple different ways that we go about that. But the other thing that that won't get at necessarily is a more operational view of um, any service provider. And so what I'd like to be able to continue to iterate on on the mail list are some of these operational uh, concerns. Uh, so the most obvious of these might be the attestation verification service itself. So if the CSP is providing that verification service and also the services. Uh, some people might see a conflict of interest in that and other people might just see continuing to rely on the same party that they're already relying on. Uh, but there's likely to be other roles that are a little bit more operational than that. And one way that we could think about those is going across the spectrum of infrastructure to platform the software to function. Uh, and I will just sort of hand wave for now uh, that there's probably an increasing number of services that are provided by each of those and sort of a fattening of the, the TCB. And just want to throw that out there as food for thought for how we might be able to enumerate some of the roles or some of the services uh, that end up being within the TCB. And we have maybe two or three minutes for, for quick verbal reactions on that. I'll react by saying great topic of discussion. Um, I thought the talks today kind of pointed out the, the kind of the trade-off between making things easier for application developers who don't want to be security experts and just want to trust in the platform um, versus those who want to design and um, implement their own attestation verification service using the certificates that are provided by each of the suppliers of either hardware, firmware, software, microcode, you name it. Um, so I, that's a great topic of discussion and we kind of need to keep it separate by use cases and um, those who want to be very paranoid versus those who want the convenience of writing uh, application code that is way more secure than has been possible in the past, but 
maybe trusting the providers of the platform. All right. Thanks for that. All right, bring us home, madam. I'm sorry, did you, uh, my turn? Can I, yep, your yeah, turn. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, 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 I was, anyway, uh, multitasking. Um, the, uh, one of the challenges that I see is that, you know, we do all this work with, you know, chips and hardware attestation and, and optimizing the design of those chips and then trying to build that verification of every layer incrementally and all that. But I think the elephant in the room uh, is the, you know, privileged access that some human beings have, um, you know, across the board and across, you know, the systems around the systems that we do. And I think the, the, um, that is a piece, I mean, uh, on, in our system, we try to remove all insiders and have insiders basically interact with the system from the outside in, uh, just like everybody else and everybody gets verified the same way. So I think there's an interesting intersection between, um, you know, this exercise and then, you know, digital identity, authentication, authorization, you know, the traditional pillars mm -hmm. of trust or weaker trust that we've had so far. And the, the importance of these things is that we have the ultimate, we're trying to get to the ultimate um, uh, quality of verification at the chip level. And then we have very, very squishy human recovery things and access and privilege stuff. And so to me, when we let those two things mix, um, we end up undermining the very, very strong security that we put in place in the first place. And so I think that's yeah. that probably something that we need to encapsulate in the discussion. Yeah, those are exactly the kind of rules that I would like us to be able to have um, a better depiction of and help people think about. And with that, uh, we are out of time for today's meeting. So let's uh, continue the, the momentum on this on the mail list. And also remember to uh, help out our colleagues in the repositioning working group with the items 